My name is Barry Kirshner. I'm the executive director of the Valerie Fund. I've got a very easy job tonight. I'm going to turn the podium over to Lori Abrams, our director of development, who set up this amazing evening and convinced everyone to come out and uh, learn a little bit more on behalf of the Valerie Fund. So without further ado, Lori Abrams, director of development. Welcome to the Valerie Fund's second annual educational seminar on love, loss, and grief. As Barry said, I'm Lori. I'm the Director of Development for the Valerie Fund. After 36 years of taking care of children with cancer and blood disorders in New Jersey, New York, and Metro Philly, we at the Valerie Fund have developed a network of thousands of patient families, clinicians, and supporters who generously share their networks with us and so we find ourselves in receipt of intellectual gold that is simply too precious to keep for ourselves. The Valerie Fund, as many of you know, is about hope and healing, body and spirit. That is what we make possible every single day for 4,000 children with cancer and blood disorders and the families who love them. Currently, we're laying the groundwork for a grief support program for Valerie Fund families whose children have fought hard and bravely and ultimately succumbed. Last year, at our first educational seminar, participants learned about a new form of targeted medicine called immunotherapy by researchers from the University of Pennsylvania and Novartis Oncology. They're developing a specific therapy for children and adults with leukemia. And they're reprogramming the patient's own cells to turn on the receptors that help them fight cancer. And in a significant number of cases, they're winning. No chemo, no radiation. It's not perfect, but the goal is a cure that will be less toxic and more effective than the treatments we rely on today. Today, our subject is one of the most universal emotions, and that is grief. So how ironic it is that this is perhaps the one that makes us feel most alone. But today, we are not alone. We're joined by two extraordinary people who are determined to bring effective treatment to those grieving when a loved one has left them behind after illness or tragedy. Stephanie Mulberg is a Valerie Fund mom who lost her son Eric 10 years ago. Dr. Catherine Shear is the person who helped Stephanie move through her grief after four difficult years so that she could once again find happiness in her life and with her family. This presentation is relevant not only for those of us who are grieving today, and for those of, but for those of us who wish to support friends and family when words fall short. Whether clinicians, Valerie Fund families, or new friends, this room is filled with people for whom the title love, loss, and grief strikes a chord. We are so glad you came tonight. And now I'd like to introduce you to Stephanie Mulberg. Thank you. A lot of familiar faces here. Thank you for all coming. Um, and for, for those who don't know my story, in August 2002, my son Eric arrived home from summer camp. We had dinner that evening, and Eric told my husband, David, and I about his wonderful summer. He casually mentioned that his hip hurt. A few days later, I took Eric to a pediatric orthopedist who took x-rays and told us that Eric would feel better in a few days. When the doctor showed me the x-ray, I saw a shadow, and I asked what it was. He told me that it was gas. The following week, I took Eric for a follow-up visit because he was not feeling better. This time, the shadow that I had asked about had grown considerably in size. It was not gas. The doctor didn't tell me anything at the time, but he arranged for an emergency MRI. After the MRI, Eric insisted that I take him to the first night of a basketball clinic that he was enrolled in. I hesitated because I wanted Eric to rest, certain that he would feel better if he gave himself time to heal. But no rest would heal Eric. The next day, we found out the shadow was a tumor. On October 2nd, 2002, my world shattered. 
Eric was diagnosed at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with stage four Ewing sarcoma bone cancer that had metastasized to his bone marrow. After Eric's first round of chemotherapy and after 10 days in the hospital, we returned home to New Jersey. I received a phone call from an oncologist in town suggesting that I contact the Valerie, Funter, Valerie Fund to see if they would coordinate with the hospital in Philadelphia so that Eric could have some of his treatments closer to home. The Valerie Fund Center became a second home to us. This wonderful organization provides families with centers close to home, providing state-of-the-art care in a happy, upbeat environment. The proximity of the center, less than a mile from our home, was a true blessing. During the next seven months, Eric had six rounds of chemotherapy, two stem cell transplants, and a hemipelvectomy, which was the removal of half of his pelvis. He was in a full body cast for three months. For 16 months, I was Eric's caretaker, a devoted and loving caretaker. When Eric relapsed, he was concerned that he would have to go back to the hospital. I promised him that that would not happen. But that was a promise I was unable to keep. One month before he died, he was unexpectedly hospitalized. I climbed into the bed with him and told him that I was sorry that he had to spend another night in the hospital. He said, it's OK, Mommy. I'm with you, and you make me feel safe. Four weeks later, Eric died at home in my bed next to me. Nothing prepared me for the loss of Eric. Even knowing that he would die did not prepare me. After Eric's death, I was not prepared for how hard it would be, to, how hard I would find it to reenter life. I was not entirely surprised to find that being a mourner was lonely, but I was surprised to discover how lost I felt. In the days following Eric's death, I did not know what I was supposed to do, nor did it seem like my friends or family knew what to do. While grief is a universal experience, it's also a very unique experience. People grieve in their own ways, and grief often leaves us feeling more alone and unsettled than almost any other experience. Most of us have intense reactions after losing someone close. Often there is disbelief, intense yearning and longing, and overwhelming sadness, preoccupation with thoughts and memories of the deceased, and difficulty concentrating on or caring very much about ordinary life. This is what is known as acute grief. For most people, acute grief subsides, leaving a much more subtle feeling of longing and sadness that is not all so encompassing. We consider grief as the form love takes when someone we love dies. The loss is permanent, and so is our grief. When we love deeply, we grieve deeply. The natural healing process can be like a roller coaster, pulling us into the pain and pushing us away from it as we move toward coming to terms with the painful reality. Eventually, most people find ways to treasure the memories of those they lost while restoring a sense of purpose and meaning and the capacity for joy and satisfaction to their own lives. However, an estimated 7% of bereaved people develop complicated grief, the painful and debilitating syndrome I did. Complicated grief is a condition that occurs when the natural adapted response to bereavement becomes stalled. People with complicated grief often feel stuck. For people who get stuck in grief, nothing seems to change. Years after a loved one dies, it's as if the death happened yesterday. Time, st <clears throat> time seems to stop, and with it, the mourner's life comes to a standstill, too. When you have complicated grief, your heart is broken. You are convinced that your life is over, and you get resigned to the fact that the, 
and the intense pain will never end. People with complicated grief, like me, don't know what's wrong. They assume that their lives have been irreparably damaged by their loss and cannot imagine how they can ever feel better. Grief dominates their lives. Those with complicated grief sometimes think that by enjoying life, they are betraying their loved one. I did. In the days and weeks after Eric died, I walked the house as if I might find him there, that he would call my name. While Eric was in transplant, he was not allowed to touch anything that hadn't been washed in 24 hours. Eric had two baby blankets, and he slept with one under his head every night. These blankets had to be washed daily. Eric's transplant room was on the third floor, and the washing machine was on the 11th. A few times I went upstairs during the day to wash his blanket, but the machines were always full. I wanted Eric to have a blanket each day, so I set an alarm to wake me at 2 in the morning, and I would race upstairs to put the blanket in the washing machine, rush back to his room, and then 40 minutes later, go back and put it in the dryer. There was no one else doing laundry in the middle of the night. For months after Eric died, I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I would wash his blanket. The other blanket is with him in his coffin. I used to wake in a panic that I might have forgotten even one detail about Eric, or that I would forget one day. I struggled to remember every detail afraid to forget even one. Eric was sick for 16 months, and during that time, many people wanted to buy him presents. And I would ask him if there was anything that he wanted, and he always said, I don't need anything, Mommy. I have you. And then he would ask me if I wanted anything, and I would say, I don't need anything. But Eric would be thrilled to know that I did get a very special gift, one that gave me my life back and gave the sister that Eric loved so very much her mother back. And this was a therapy that Dr. Shear developed, complicated grief therapy. This wonderful woman sitting beside me, Dr. Shear, has spent more than 20 years researching grief. I met Dr. Shear four years after Eric died. I met all the criteria for complicated grief but the study that Dr. Shear was conducting was for individuals over 60. Since I couldn't participate in the study, Dr. Shear asked if I would allow her to tape our sessions, and she would use the tapes to train other therapists in this new type of therapy, complicated grief therapy. I agreed. Now, people send me names and addresses of those that have lost a child, and I contact them. I offer help. I listen. I let them tell me the excruciating, painful, and desperate details. I only hope that they will find themselves as I did. To a newly bereaved person, I would say, you are not alone. The sadness is overwhelming. Your life is changed forever, but you need not face this darkness alone. People want to lend their support to share your grief and to stand by you in the dark hours. You need to allow them to do so, as we do not grieve well alone. With their presence, they testify to the interconnectedness of humankind, to the common thread of life and death that binds us all. There is a part of me that died with Eric, an empty spot in my heart that still aches and I am still saddened when I think of what he might have been. But I'm not alone. He is with me in my heart. I'm a private person, and sharing my story so openly, whether at a conference or on TV or in the news, was not a decision that I made quickly. Before Eric died, I was unsure of how to approach someone that had lost someone. What should I say? What should I do? How could I help? 
My hunch is that many of you here today also ask yourself the same questions. Grief is a scary topic in our culture. Grief remains strangely taboo. But the more that we make death, and talking about death, a natural part of life, the more that people will feel supported. Dr. Shear helped me unlock the door of my own heart that Eric's death had slammed shut. Along the way, I became increasingly determined to spread the word about this condition so that others struggling the way that I did can get the help that they need. So tonight, I'm proud to be here to introduce you to Dr. Shear, who is not only the leading authority on complicated grief, but one of the warmest, kindest people I have ever met. Please give a warm welcome to this very dedicated leader in her field, Dr. Catherine Shear. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I, I really, I have to say, I have heard this story many times, and I right now am struggling myself with a lot of emotion. I can only imagine what many of you are feeling right now. And um, so I really thank you so much for sharing this story, and not only for sharing it, but for the way you share it, Stephanie. It's amazing. I also want to say thank you to Lori and to Barry and to everyone at the Valerie Fund to have invited me here to talk about this topic, about loss, really love, loss, and grief. I think the Valerie, the Valerie Fund itself was founded by love, loss, and grief. And it obviously provides a unique and very, very important support for so many families with severe illness of a child. And my hope is that tonight will mark the beginning of some kind of collaboration with the Valerie Fund and our Center for Complicated Grief at Columbia University. It's also an honor to be here again with Stephanie, who I have to say is one of the smartest, most dedicated, generous, caring, and courageous people I know. And I've worked with a lot of people professionally, and I've worked with a lot of people as clients or patients, and Stephanie really does stand out. And I also want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I know that many of you, as Lori said, are either struggling with grief yourself, or know someone who is, or you are Valerie Fund families who are struggling with illness of a child. But coming here means that you're not turning your back. You're not turning your back on learning and thinking about death and loss, even though we live in a culture where these subjects are really not discussed in polite company. I actually have stories of dinner parties if you're interested later on. The truth is, though, that these are not easy topics. They're, not e they're really not easy topics. In fact, our brains, you may not know, but our brains react to reminders of death in ways outside of our awareness that actually do influence us. In fact, the notion that our brains operate largely outside of our awareness is something that neuroscientists are increasingly learning and learning about and learning how they do that. And I'm going to actually talk about that's relevant to understanding bereavement. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. I'll come back to that. So I'm going to show you slides, because that's what I do. I talk with slides. Um, and I want to start, oops, I'm trying to get this, if I can get this open, yeah. OK. I want to start by reminding you that even though we don't like to talk about it, um, two and a half million people, people do die, a lot of people do die 
every year. Two and a half million people, about two and a half million people die every year. And these numbers relate to the top 10 causes of death. And one of the things you can see is the 10th most common cause is suicide. And I know there have been some suicides in the New Jersey community recently. And that, of course, is a, an, an especially difficult form, circumstance of death. And it may be even more common than we think because many, many people think that a lot of, of deaths that are declared accidents are actually suicide and also sometimes even heart disease, which you can see is way up here, um, may be in fact a suicide. But the fact is, however they die, two and a half million people die every year and they leave somewhere we estimate between five and 10 million bereaved people. So each, that means that each person who dies has somewhere between two and four people who are very, very close to them. And that again is an estimate because there is no what we call operationalized definition. There's no actual consensus definition of what it is to be bereaved. I'll tell you what mine is in a, in a couple of minutes. But this is a very important thing to remember when someone we love dies, because as Lori and Stephanie have both said, one of the things that typically happens after we lose someone is that we feel so alone. And if nothing else, this tells us that we are not alone. And it's worth remembering that simple fact. So let me start by just introducing you to the definitions that I use, because these words are used commonly by lots of people, even the professional that I know don't all use them in exactly this way. So we use bereavement in our work to mean the experience of having lost someone. And grief is the response to bereavement, the response to that loss. And we actually like to think about grief as having three different forms, really two forms usually. And this is not a phase model. If you're familiar with the phases of grief, there's a lot of evidence that we don't really go through any kind of systematic phases. But we do generally experience an initial response. You can think of it as the response that you know when you go to visit someone after, um, shortly after they've lost someone. They're in a very different place, you know, than, say, if you checked in with them five years later. And the first place we call acute grief. And the second place we call integrated grief. And integrated grief is not a, a time-limited kind of of experience, it's really a response, it's, it's permanent. And complicated grief, we're gonna talk more about it, but complicated grief is the condition that occurs when that transition basically doesn't happen. And mourning is the basically the psychological processes that are set in motion in order to transform acute to integrated grief. So what I want to do in the remainder of the time that I'm going to speak to you is that I'm going to break this up into two parts. And in the first part, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about these ideas about grief and what's behind them and what they mean in your life, hopefully. Then we're going to pause for just a moment, and I'm going to let you reflect on that. And then I want to introduce you to the whole syndrome of complicated grief and, and basically kind of walk you through some of the highlights of the treatment we do so you can see that. And then we'll end with, um, actually I have a few video clips of, of a couple of people who went through this treatment. So the first thing I want to say is, is to, to describe a little bit more, Stephanie just did this, but what we mean by acute grief, and again, the initial response to bereavement, and what we feel right after someone dies is almost always a sense of frequent, strong feelings of yearning and longing and sorrow. And these can come in waves, they often do come in waves, some people like to imagine them as waves crashing on a beach, but they come in waves, and they are often accompanied by a whole range of other feelings, guilt, anxiety, anger, any kind of feeling you can imagine people have in the wake of an important loss. But actually, most people also have positive feelings, and they have those positive feelings during periods when they are able to kind of, kind of ignore the, the reality for a few minutes, and that's a very natural thing to do, but to sort of set it aside, 
pay attention to whatever's going on in the room or remember the person who died with warm and loving thoughts and, and feelings. So these positive feelings do kind of make their way even in acute grief, and that's actually very important. Our thinking right after someone dies is usually focused very, very, very like razor sharp on, on that person. We're really not very interested in anything else or anyone else. There's very frequently a sense of disbelief, and many times we feel a kind of insecurity about ourselves because so much of ourselves is very much tied up with the people that we love. And as I said before, this is usually time limited. So people talk about grief as not having a time limit, and that's absolutely true. But acute grief, this kind of very intense, persistent, very intense experience does subside, thankfully does subside. And some people say that it usually subsides actually more quickly than we expect it to. Because in the beginning, it feels like the world is over, period. And when it subsides, it doesn't mean that grief is over. Instead, it means that we have essentially begun that process. We're well on our way of, to the process of integrating grief, which is something we do by coming to terms with the reality, by understanding the finality and the consequences of the loss, by finding a way to continue our relationship, whatever it might be, with the person who died in a very, very different way. So we don't, we don't literally continue, well, we do literally continue it, but it's internalized, of course. And we have to work that out. It's not, it's not right away immediately obvious. And then we also have to really kind of redefine ourselves. We have to redefine our goals and our plans so that we can envision a life that has the possibility for meaning and purpose and joy and satisfaction even without this person that we love so much. And as I said, integrated grief is permanent. So this we experience for the rest of our lives. And actually, it's not always sort of um, so muted and in the background. It will surge up. Grief will surge typically at periods, for example, the anniversary of the death, typically um, the holidays, a person's birthday, we call these difficult times, but there are always calendar days which are especially provocative. And there are periods in our life also when grief will surge, even after we've pretty much um, come to terms with it, assimilated it, integrated it. And sometimes, though, we don't do that. We don't really, there isn't that, that sort of acceptance, that understanding, that comprehension. We don't feel, as Stephanie told you, she was, uh, she was constantly afraid that she was going to forget Eric as opposed to being in touch really with the, the way in which that was actually impossible. It's not possible to forget someone that you're very close to. Um, so, but when people worry about that a lot and or when other kinds of, of thoughts or feelings or behaviors kind of come to the fore, they can get in the way of this process. And what you end up with is this persistent acute grief, just pretty much like it was in the very beginning. And that's accompanied by and actually sometimes kind of dominated by the kinds of thoughts and feelings and behaviors that interfere with the mourning process, which I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. But right now I want to talk a little more about grief because Stephanie said we think of grief as a form of love and I want to try to explain that to you. That is exactly how I see it. In fact, I would say that grief is the form love takes when someone we love dies. In other words, that all of that wonderful, warm, loving feeling that we have towards the person when we think about them or when we're with them is now tinged with yearning and sadness. And it's impossible that it wouldn't be because we know they're gone. So that's the sense in which I mean that grief is a form of love. And that doesn't mean that if you really love someone, that means you have to grieve intensely for them throughout the rest of your life. But it does mean that we should honor grief because it is a form of love. 
And it also means that if we want to understand grief, and that's really one of the things that I'm very, very interested in, it means we have to understand love. So what is love? And we have been studying love for a number of decades now in psychology. And we know a little bit about it now. One of the things we know is that it's not only something that we all know is important. If you didn't come to this lecture, you would know that it, love is very, very important. But it's also true that love is something that we're born with, that we're biologically predisposed to want. We want to seek, form, and maintain close relationships, love relationships with a small number of people throughout our lives. And that actually starts before we're born, in our mother's womb it starts, we now know, and it continues, again, throughout our life. And what do we mean by love? Well, this love has also been defined in this way. It's also called an attachment relationship in psychology, if those of you who know that lingo. But it's, it's basically what we feel for a person who is rewarding to be with most of the time. It doesn't have to be all the time, but most of the time. Someone we don't want to be separated from, all things being equal. Someone who provides us with comfort and solace when we're feeling bad. And also who is our cheerleader and our coach when we're out there on our own, doing new things or doing old things or whatever, doing things on our own. And that actually turns out to be a very, very important aspect of love. So the other thing about it is that because it has this biological basis, the people we love are actually become literally a part of us. We, we always talk about people we love defining us, but they are literally a part of our brains. They become interwoven. They're, thoughts, feelings about them become interwoven in a very special way in our minds. And it turns out that when we start, as well as when we stop a love relationship throughout our lives, we experience a poorly regulated state of mind and strong emotions. And so you see in this slide, am I crazy or falling in love? We all know that, right? I mean, we, we feel crazy when we're falling in love probably true when we first, when we have a baby too, we're in some kind of, I just have, had a grandson and I can tell you my daughter was in an altered state of consciousness for quite a while, um, as was I actually. So, so we, you know, we experience this not only when we lose a relationship, but also when we gain it, when we're in a transition with respect to love. And that is because of the way that our brains are actually affected by our close relationships. And it has another implication, which is that when we lose someone we love, we cannot forget them. We do not forget them, but we cannot forget them. And I like this, this image from the internet, which says that trying to forget someone you love is like trying to remember someone you never met. I think it's well said. So this means, actually, that if we go back to what we need to do after we lose someone close, basically, we have to mourn. Remember, that's the, the processes that help us transform acute to integrated grief. It's the processes that are entailed in coming to terms with the loss so that we can go on in a meaningful way with our own lives. And I am going to suggest to you that mourning is essentially a learning process. So what is it that we need to learn? Well, we need to learn what it means, what the reality means, and that is, what is we, we need to understand the finality and the consequences of this loss, which we absolutely cannot do the moment someone dies. It's impossible. Um, so we, it takes a while, and that's, the, that's what we're doing during mourning, is we're trying to figure out how we can understand that. We also, as I said before, need to forge a new kind of relationship with the person who died, and we need to find a way to reinvent our own lives, re-envision our own lives in a way that has not only joy and satisfaction and happiness, but purpose and meaning, so that we can go on in the way that we know that our loved ones would want us to. So I want to say a little bit more before I stop this part about 
what, what I think can assist the mourning process. And I think there are basically three fundamental things that can assist us in mourning at any stage of mourning. And you'll see as we move forward how we also incorporate these, these three kinds of processes into the complicated grief treatment that we do. So the first one, Stephanie mentioned, receiving support from friends. We don't grieve well alone. Lots of things we don't do well alone, but this is one in particular that people seem to really know that other people need support because all cultures, you know, people gather around a grieving individual. And we do need someone by our side to bear witness and to, and to kind of help us along as we do this really, really daunting learning process. Because the other thing, it is a learning process, and it's also learning something that we absolutely do not want to learn. So maybe a lot of people in the room didn't want to learn arithmetic sometime way back then. But it's nothing like this. This is something we, we just don't, we resist learning and we still have to learn it. So the first thing is support from, from close friends. The second thing is that we need to practice self-compassion. And I, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, so I won't say more now. And the third thing is that another thing that social psychologists have discovered is that we have three fundamental basic needs. And this is across cultures, across age groups, across everything that they've looked at. And there's been a fair amount of research in this area. And these three needs are to feel a sense of relatedness or a sense of belonging, to feel a sense of, of autonomy, meaning that we are connected to our authentic selves and that what we do is intrinsically motivated, that we are actually acting, that, that, we, that we act out of what we really truly believe in, what we really truly care about, what we're really truly interested in and able to do. And the third thing is that we have a sense of competence in our own ability to meet meaningful challenges. So, we need to honor these needs because they are all disrupted by the loss of someone close. It, we feel like we don't belong anywhere. We feel like we don't know who we are, so we can't be connected to our authentic selves. And we feel almost completely incompetent. And I think there are reasons, there are ways we can explain why we have all that. There's not enough time tonight to do that. But I'm just going to say a little bit more about each one of these three um, processes. So in terms of receiving support from friends, that's very, very important. But there are really two components to receiving support from people, right? One of them is that there are people around willing and able to provide that support. And the, and the support that we're talking about is not a support that is oriented towards fixing anybody. Very often, all of us, when we're with someone who's emotionally upset, we want to calm them down. We want them to feel better. We want to do something to help them. We have a very strong urge to do that. And as the friend of someone who's grieving, we have to inhibit that urge. We have to just be there and be willing to listen and, and bear witness and accept the feelings. Because this is not something that, we, that any of us can tell any of the other of us how to do or what to do. So I like the little st sort of sticky thing there. I, I can't promise to fix your problems, but I can promise you you won't have to face them alone. And that's really basically what the role of friends is, to make sure that the person d feels that they're not facing their grief alone. And then the other little saying from the internet, um, really addresses the other side of receiving help. Because the other side of receiving help is being willing to ask and receive it, and to ask and take it in. And for someone who's grieving, that can be particularly difficult. I think many of you know Rabbi Matthew Gewertz. And he's written a book. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And one of the things he points out in this book is that it can be very, very hard it almost always is very hard when we're grieving to ask for or receive help because we are worried, what if it makes us look weak? What if we really are weak? That's a terrible thing in our culture. What if we're always the one other people lean on and now we have to be the one 
to get help, and we feel very ashamed of that? What if it feels like there isn't anyone that really wants to listen to us or be there for us? Or what if we even fear that the people who might be there to help us are not going to help, they're going to hurt us? So for many different reasons, and everyone has their own reason, but we all are a little bit hesitant. So we have to open ourselves to receiving that help. Okay, the second thing I said was that we needed to practice self-compassion. I think we all know what compassion is. Certainly everyone who has anything to do with the Valerie Fund knows what compassion is. I think the Valerie Fund epitomizes compassion, the dictionary definition of which is a feeling of wanting to help someone who's hurting, someone who's sick or hungry or in trouble, such that we pay attention to that distress and we have some desire to alleviate it. And we, I, I'm guessing that pretty much everyone in this room has high levels of compassion. But now I'm going to ask you, how do you think about yourself with respect to your own troubles and your own distress? And if you're like me or Charlie Brown, you might be inclined to ask yourself, where have I gone wrong? To, to be very on a, I'm, I'm, sometimes people have accused me of being on a continuous self-improvement campaign. And when you do this, you might get an answer like, this is gonna take a lot more than one night. So if you're interested, you can weigh yourself with regard to your self-compassion by going to that website, but I'm gonna show you a couple of the questions, just four of them that are used to test yourself about your self-compassion. And you might want to just jot down what number fits you the most. So are you disapproving and judgmental about your own flaws and inadequacy? How often are you disapproving and judgmental? When you're feeling down, do you tend to obsess and fixate on everything that's wrong? When you're really struggling, do you tend to feel like other people must be having a much easier time of it? And when you think about your inadequacies, does it tend to, feel, to make you feel more separate and cut off from the rest of the world? So if you scored, if you scored yourself, and if you scored a four or a five on most, or actually even any of these, then you have a, t a little too much uh, weight. In, in t you need to lose some weight. Um, you need to lower that score. You need to be more self-compassionate. And really what that means is to treat yourself like we treat the other people that we care about in our lives. And what that means is that we need to notice our own suffering, not try to block it out or ignore it, but to notice it and be kind to ourselves about that and not harsh and judgmental. We need to remind ourselves that suffering is universal. Everyone makes mistakes, has misfortunes, everyone suffers. And lastly, when we're feeling very emotionally activated, as we always are during acute grief, we need to remember not to get completely caught up in our own emotions, in our own pain, such that we think that there, that's all there is. That there, you know, that it can. When we're very emotional, we can forget that there's a lot more to our world and the world at large than what we're feeling right in that moment. I'm going to tell you a couple of other interesting things about self-compassion. The first one is that this is not being selfish or self-centered or self-pitying or prioritizing our own needs over those of others. It's not that at all. And I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but women almost all, well, in general, have lower self-compassion than men. So women may have higher compassion, but we have lower self-compassion typically. But the good news is we can learn. Self-compassion can be learned. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention in terms of how we can help ourselves is to remember to honor those basic human needs. And the first one is that we need a sense of belonging. So this image shows uh, you know, says that the best feeling in the world is knowing that you actually mean someone to, something to someone, and very often that's what we've lost, but we still need to do what we can to let ourselves feel like we matter and we belong to people. We need to be ourselves 
in a world that Ralph Waldo Emerson thought was constantly trying to make you into something else. We still need to be, whether, whether the world is or not, we need, to be, we need to be ourselves. And we need to concentrate on being ourselves and sort of monitor that as we're going through this very, very difficult period. And lastly, we need to have the courage to face the greatest fears that we, well, this is an Eleanor Roosevelt quote that you probably recognize, that you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face, that you must do the things that you think you cannot do. And I would venture to say that there isn't one among us who doesn't feel that coping with the death of someone we love very much is something that we cannot do. And yet we must. We must look that, the fear of that, in the face. <laughs>